so I'm going to try to move through this relatively quick today because I've had a lot of questions from you guys about, you know, like things that I did in Australia and like all the different struggles that you've had with having maybe 25 players and you're the only coach on the field and you don't really have equipment and like how to run practices and different things like that. So I just want to touch on these things and then I'll touch on that as well and I'll draw some stuff on this um, pad over here. Um, this is 20 things that I've learned over the past couple of years as a coach with the Astros. And what I tried to do in this is I tried to put a lot of social media in here. Okay? I'm a fan and I'm not a fan of Twitter and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot of really good information on out there today and it's free. There's a lot of great stuff that's posted. But there's a lot, also a lot of garbage out there. And so you got to learn how to filter through all that and figure out what's good and what's not good. And so I put a lot of clips up here. As I scroll through social media, Twitter, Instagram, and I find things that I like, I just save it, put it in my notes, take a note on my phone, do something like that, and I would recommend you guys do the same thing. So I'll have different names up here of guys that I follow and that I'm constantly going to and like getting valuable information from. So write those guys down, feel free to follow them, and I, I guarantee you'll get some good, good bits of information from them. So the first thing is this, and I've said this before, don't give people answers. Teach concepts. Don't give your player the answer. Give them the puzzle pieces and let them put it together. It's going to be more valuable to them in the long run. Okay, so I've said it a couple of times. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And don't cheat people out of their growth. Empower them to solve their own problems. Come up with their own ideas and watch them grow. So, like, I stand by this. I don't want to give my players the answer. I want to give them the puzzle pieces and lead them to their own answer. That way it sticks and it's more valuable to them. Okay? So this is a tweet, UCD Psychology. I talked to my guys about this. I know you can't see it very well, so I'll read it. But this is talking about learning and tips on how to learn. I think it's pretty powerful and you can apply it. So tip number one. Develop a habit of learning and find short, effective routines. Read 20 minutes a day. Do 10 minutes of throwing a ball against a wall and filling it. Have little routines every day that drives you toward your ultimate goal. Two, do it regularly, but do it in short stints. You don't need a five-hour practice. One five-hour practice a week is not near as good as doing 20 minutes of quality work on your own every single day. Number three, identify your key questions to start the study period. Use these to focus your work. We talked about it yesterday. Make sure you're diagnosing things properly. Make sure you're attacking the right problem. Number four, summarize it. Less but better. You don't need to, like if you're going to talk to someone, you don't need to like, use all these elaborate crazy words and go overboard. Say less but say it better. You only have 500 words in a cage or in a, practice, in a day. Use them wisely. Tip number five, reward yourself. As you're making progress, you want to keep your players motivated and yourself motivated. As you hit small goals, reward yourself. Make a big deal out of getting better and learning more. Number six, assess your progress as you study. Uh, measure things. Show progress. Do you want to change something? Measure it. And number seven, it's best to study under exam conditions. Play the game. Make practice hard. Make it as game-like as possible. So these are tips on how to learn. They directly correlate to how I coach and how I present practice plans and teach my players. So what's the role of a coach? We talked about it yesterday. You're just creating an environment and you're a gardener. That's all you are. You're not a conductor. You're a gardener. You give them the puzzle pieces, you put them in an environment where they can learn, and you allow them to put the puzzles together themselves. We need to ask the right questions to our players to promote ownership. Okay? This is Lance Wheeler, Baseball Think Tank. Don't ask what you want to do. Oh, don't ask what do you want to do yet. Yeah. Instead, ask why do you want to do it. So I like to tell my players the what, and I like them to come up with a why. Hey, this, your load's not great. Why do you think we need a hinge right there? Why do, why do we need to do this? And I'm asking them the question, and I want to hear their answer. Ask more questions. Everyone knows the what. Very few people know the why. Once you know the why, it helps your mental representation, and you know why you're trying to go about doing things. 
Ask your players more questions. Don't tell them. Okay, so what, why, and how? Tell them the what. Be objective, right? We want to be objective. We want to measure things as best we can. Give them the what. Ask them the why. They're going to let you know what they're thinking, how they're interpreting the information. That's going to give you more insight and to continue to work with them. And then together, because it's their career, it's their journey, especially with your elite guys, y'all come up with a how together. If they don't like your how and they don't, it doesn't speak to them, you're not speaking their language, it's not going to work. It doesn't match the mental representation. You have to speak your own player's language, each individual language. And so y'all need to come up with a how together. Give them the what, have them explain the why to you to learn more about how they're thinking and together come up with a how. Number three, if you want to change something, measure it. Bottom line, track things. Get creative. Measure their OPS. Measure their walks. Measure their strikeouts. Use video. Ground balls, if you're hitting someone ground balls, how many did they fill cleanly? How many did they mess up? Keep track of these things. We were just talking about Vanderbilt. They track everything. Be creative, guys. There's a lot of different ways you can do this, and there's no right or wrong way. But if you want something to change, just track it. Measure it. Okay? Knowledge of performance, knowledge of results. We talked about this yesterday. I think it's key to remember that it's not that just measuring things is way better, right? They progressed at the same rate. So there's a time and a place for instruction and there's a time and a place for just shutting up and letting it happen. You as a coach, the art form is knowing when to shut up and when to speak. And typically with younger guys, it's better to just shut up and let them externally have cues and externally accomplish tasks. But measure it. Okay, players need to feel safe and challenged. Okay, this is a, a picture of Coach K with LeBron and Kobe. A leader's number one priority is to establish a safe environment and culture of trust. Without trust, nothing matters. If your player doesn't trust you, they're not going to listen to you. If they don't think you're there to help them, they're not going to listen. If they think you're there for all, like, your own ego or to boost your credibility in the league just to get wins, they're not going to buy in and help you. It's about the player. And you have to keep the player and walk them through this constant change because change is happening all the time. Okay, motivation and performance, time. As time goes on, they, they, when you teach something new, there's first shock, oh my gosh, I've never heard this before. Then maybe, yeah, no, that can't be right. Then it goes into like, well, all right, well this is like, why can't I do it my way? That then turns into like, well, this is stupid. I don't even know if I want to play anymore. Because they can't figure it out. Then over time, they start to decide, all right, let's experiment. Decision, integration. This is the time right here that the relationship matters. When they're frustrated, they're depressed, they don't want to experiment, they're, they don't know why they can't do it their old way. You have to have a relationship and work them through those times. They have to feel safe, and they have to trust you. Number five, bored athletes don't get better. Okay, Players who get bored in practice don't really want to be good. Champions get better. Losers get bored. Make practice hard. Keep people motivated. You can't practice. You cannot practice soft and expect to play hard. Okay, motivation. We talked about this yesterday. This is the process of learning. It's going to be slow. You're going to pick up on it. You're going to get better at it quickly. And then it's going to plateau off, and that's going to continue on over and over and over and over again. So we want to show progress, make it hard, and can constantly change things up. Number six, your practice setup is a massive deal. You need to spend prep time making sure that before you step foot on that field, things are planned out, you have a goal for everything that you're going to do, and it's ready to rock and roll, and everything's set up and ready to go. Everything has a trade-off. Know this. Everything has a trade-off. There's whole practice and there's part practice. The only whole practice that we can do is the game. Everything else is a modified version of it. 
Whole practice is the best practice there ever is. To get better at playing baseball and hitting live pitching, the best thing in the world to do is to face a pitcher. But we always don't have that a, a, like possibility. So we have to come up with trade-offs to come up with adequate part practices. In my opinion, one thing that I never, like that, that I make sure I keep at all times is velocity. The game is getting faster and faster and faster and faster. And I do not want my guys hitting on anything under the MLB average of speed right now. Every like, the velocity is a trade off. I will not give up. I'll give up an arm. I'll put it in a machine. But I want the velocity. Everything has a trade off, and as a coach, you have to decide: is it worth giving up or not? Because okay, I may want velocity, but like maybe my arm as a coach is tired and I can't throw that hard. So, like, I'm going to give up the arm to put it in a machine to get the velocity. That's just me. Maybe you want curveballs. Maybe you want the arm. Whatever you want, you have to understand that you have to give something up to get something. Everything has a trade-off. Everything you do needs a whine. Okay? Everything you do needs a whine. If I came to your practice and I was like, hey, why are you doing this? If you told me, well, this is how it, we've always done it. Wrong answer. Every single thing you do from a setup to a distance to a speed to an angle to everything needs a whine. So as far as is, does it, like I don't use tees. I don't. I totally understand why you do. But for me, the reason I don't use tees is because that's one contact point and there is no speed or variability there. I want to teach variability and handling change of speeds. So this is Bart. I don't know how to say his name, but he's over there in the Netherlands. A lot of you guys probably know him. Just hitting on a tee, transfer to real competition. Hitting on a baseball or, uh, a baseball or softball equals an open skill. Perception to action where environment dictates motor control. T equals closed skill with unchanging environment. I, he doesn't think so. It's not adequate for teaching how to hit a baseball at a high level. Okay, and then Fangraphs posted a, an article about the physics of batting practice and why standing you know, 40 feet away, throwing 40 miles an hour is completely unrealistic, even though it's out of an arm, batting practice. It's just not getting you ready. Why do I want to practice at an equivalent speed of 80 miles an hour when I'm about to go face 94 on a daily basis? It's a completely different thing. So like, if I'm going to do BP... If you came and watched my practice, everything I do, I have a very specific why on why I'm doing it. Have a why. Don't just do it to do it because you've seen other people do it. Have a why. This is another one. Variation in incoming speed creates two scientifically and perhaps athletically relevant issues. First, the ball bat collision is distinctly different in the exit velocity off the bat. And this depends on the pitch speed. Secondly, the batter's timing abilities are essentially unchallenged with T-work and strongly challenged by the pitching machine. This is an excerpt by the article from um, Fangraphs. Variation is important, guys. Change up practice. Okay? We want to change things up. Remember, think about variation and different challenging tasks in practice as natural selection in practice. We're trying to weed out the bad movements and keep the strong, stable movements. And we can only do that by adding a lot of variation. We want to build the house, and we want to knock it down every single day. We do our drill work, we do our routines, we do our teaching to build it up, to create a mental representation, to create good movement patterns, and then we challenge it with variation and try to pick on the weaknesses. Practice should be hard. Failure is the only option. Okay? Stuart McMillan, we can only learn through failure. Learn from failure through one, reflection, two, claiming responsibility, and three, taking action. If we follow the above three steps, it's not failure, but it's a lesson. The only way you can learn is to fail. Bottom line, this has to be hard because this game is extremely hard. Get Conor McGregor, MMA. I never lose. I either win or I learn. That has to be your mindset. And we talked about this the other day, Daniel Coyle, talent code. 
practice, deep practice, getting better at something is like a, it, the metaphor is like climbing up an ice covered hill. You're going to slip, you're going to fall, you're going to slam your face. Dig, you got to dig your claws in and just claw your way to the top. Okay, this is from TPI. Most players are not practicing properly. People like to do what they're good at. They don't like to do what they're bad at. Make sure you're practicing what you're bad at. Do not let people just go in and do the easy way. Make it hard. Make it challenging. That's the only way to get better. Always be the furry animal. Okay? This was said to me. My first game in professional baseball, I do things differently. I'm a weirdo. I'm self, I, I know I'm a weirdo. <laughs> so I set up our crazy batting practice. First day in pro ball. First game. I was fortunate enough to have Sig... Um, who was our chief analytics guy, director of decision-making sciences at the Astros was his official title. And he was my development coach that year. Special project from Jeff Luno. The team that we were playing actually came out and were making fun of us for how we were running our batting practice. They were actually chirping at us a little bit. Me, being my very first time in pro ball, felt a little self-conscious about this. He pulled me in the office, showed me this, and said... This furry animal knew the ice age was coming, but the dinosaurs were making fun of him. Always be the furry animal. Stay ahead of the curve. Don't be scared to be weird. Don't be scared to be different. If you know what's going on and you have the foresight to see what's happening, be the furry animal. Okay? So how do you coach objectively and be innovative? Okay? Again, Stuart McMillan. How he bleeds original exciting stuff into his programming Coach 75% of what you know, coach 20% of what you think, and then coach 5% of what you're guessing. Leave room for experimentation in your coaching. Not all of it. Don't make it a big experiment. Coach 75% of what you know, but leave some room for some innovation. Leave some room for learning. There are no rules. It's not how we used to do it. There are no rules. Just get results. Just get people better. Doesn't matter how. If people are getting better, people are getting better. Just get people better. 11. Hitting's rotational. It's not linear. Stop. Stop using the L word. Okay? Linear. Rotational. The circle is much more like what we see in a swing. Yes, there is an element that we could potentially say is a linear movement in rotation. <laughs> But it's rotational. Stop confusing kids. Because when we start talking linear, we start moving linearly. It's a rotational sport. We showed this graph yesterday. We are shifting pressure, but leaving our center of mass in order to rotate. The pressure shift is the linear movement to complete a rotation. Okay? It's okay to look at other rotational sports for information. I feel like back when I was playing, like if I, oh, you play golf as a hitter, that's going to ruin your swing. No, it's not. They know more about the swing than baseball players do. I, if you looked at my Instagram, it's golf, 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 golf. So much of what I do and crazy new drills and ideas that have actually got guys better have come from golf. So like, don't be scared to do it. Golf sees it. They're doing stuff, and they actually created that new U-based university thing, the new TPI baseball stuff. There's clear similarities between the golf swing and the baseball swing. They've just been using this technology and doing it longer than we have. Consistency starts with the hips. This right here would be closer to a reverse spine angle. This, stabilizing the front hip, getting ready to rotate. This is good. This is bad. They've known that in golf for a long time. Look at other rotational sports. It's the same movement patterns. Golf, lead foot, push off. Power early in the downswing is essential. Body track sports can assess this. The more you stabilize that front leg and apply vertical force, the more bat speed you have. Just like in golf. Do no harm. Identify the right goal and get better at that. Okay, if you don't know what you're shooting for, you'll definitely miss the target. Okay? One thing that I see, and I'm a huge fan of strength conditioning, huge fan of it. But one thing that I see, especially in pro ball, 
is that the strength conditioning coaches sometimes think that these athletes are there to be like professional weightlifters. But guess what? These guys are lifting weights to get better at baseball. Just like in the cage, these guys aren't trying to be great practicers. Everything you do needs to be designed to get them better at the baseball game at 7 o'clock at night. If you don't realize that, and anything you do is taking away from that game at 7 o'clock at night, it's a problem. Because if they're the best practicer in the world, and their BP looks unbelievable, and they can deadlift the house, but they suck in the game, they're gone. So make sure you're not doing harm. Make sure you're making them better at the game. Number 14, have a progression in mind. This is Tim Cup. He has all of his gadgets on there. How's he going to take that from that picture in his underwear and his trailer to the actual golf course? Have to have a progression in mind. Drills are great, but if you don't have a progression in mind, it's just not going to work. I have this on here. I love this. Does that look anything like a game swing in a, in a, in a baseball game? No, so I got to know there's a lot of great concepts here. A lot of great concepts here. But I got to realize as a coach, how can I take it from that and start with that and translate it all the way into a game? Progressions. Maybe I start there. Then from there, maybe I'm then standing up. Then from there, I get rid of the ball, do the same movement with the bat. Who knows, right? We come up with progressions. Every drill we do, we need to have a progression in mind so that when we master it, we're ready for the next one. Progress towards the game. Stop talking so much. This is something that I had to learn this year. I knew my mechanical stuff. My first year as a coach, things went really well. But I had a lot of room to improve. I still have a tremendous amount to improve. One of the biggest things that I do feel like I improved on this year is I shut up a lot more this year. <clears throat> I prepared my guys to compete every night while making change because I just shut up. Stop talking so much. If you're going to say, so say something productive or don't speak. Okay? It drives me crazy when you got coaches that are like, hey, see the ball. Hey, throw a strike. Like, you don't think they're trying to see the ball or you don't think they're trying to throw a strike? <laughs> if you can't tell them how or give them something productive to help them do it, just don't say anything. The kids are out there trying. The players are out there. Have you ever had a pitcher out there that's just not trying to throw a strike? Lift more weight. Okay, cool. How? Like, say something productive or just don't say something at all. That's the look I give. Like, come on, man. Everything you say is driving their attention and focus somewhere. Be aware of that. Okay, we talked about these. Internal broad, internal narrow, external narrow, external broad. We want to stay as external as possible, especially when we're competing. What you say matters. Hey, keep your elbow down, Johnny. As he's in the batter's box, what's he thinking? Internal. Pitch comes, misses it. That's on you. Know what you say matters. This is something that I had to learn, too. Everyone has their drills, right? Everyone, oh, yeah, I like to do this drill. It's great. If you give me your drill, your favorite drill... If I can't take a kid, walk up and do it right there perfectly, your drill doesn't work. You're relying on your words too much. Think about that. If the person you've never met can't do your drill properly, the drill's not set up to succeed. Your drill should be set up to succeed without your words. You should set it up. You should then let them rock and roll, and it should work. You shouldn't have to stand over and explain every nuance of your drill. If I can't do your drill, not knowing you or never seeing it being done, your drill doesn't work. Coaching cues and feedback. Focus externally good, focus internally bad. Standing in the bat, like what, screaming at them, giving bad internal cues when they're standing in the batter box, not good. Okay, so think about this. We talked about it yesterday, the 500 word challenge. Remember, your drill is not working if you have to walk them through it every single time with your words. You only have 500 words or 
pretend that you can't speak and learn how to set up practice without speaking. The sign of an amazing coach is you could go out there, set up an environment, not speak, and things go pretty well. Strive for that. We talked about intrinsic feedback and augmented feedback. There's a, there's a moment for both. Make sure that we're not one of these people driving internal focus rates up to 94, 84% during competitions. Make sure our words are, are good. Posture is a big deal, guys. Your spine is a huge deal. The spine is the chassis of the body. Five signs your chassis needs repair, right? If you're, you're burning gas like crazy, maybe like maybe you need, your chassis is a little off. Same thing. If you're not efficient, if your spine's off and your spine's moving, you're not going to be efficient. Same thing. Weird noises, right? If it's like things are going on, you, you can't figure out what's going on. I feel like I'm doing this. You have no control. It's weirdness. Your spine could be off. Poor handling. You can't control yourself very well. That rotation gets all wonky as you spin off. You're not using stable axis. Improper steering. Again, efficiency. Things are going to go wrong. I think I'm doing this. I want to go this way, but I'm not going that way. I'm having a hard time controlling things. Excessive wear on the tires. Posture is a big deal. If your spine gets off, as we've all said, it's, it's, it's a big problem. 19, do less but do it better. One of my favorite books I've read is Essentialism. Write it down, great book. It's the whole book's about do less but do it better. Say less but say it better. Like everything you do should be that. Doug Limoff, practice perfect. Practice the 20. I firmly believe in this. Identify the 20% that's going to give you 80% of the results. And do that. Focus on the attractors. Focus on the important things and ignore the noise. So many times we try to accomplish everything and we accomplish nothing. Focus on the essentials and nail it. Practice the highest priority things more than everything else combined, keep practicing them, keep hammering them. Saves time by planning better in advance. Engage the participants by repeating productive drills with minor variations to create stable movements in that. This is from essentialism. An, essential, an essentialist thinks less but better. He chooses to. Only a few things really matter. What are the trade-offs in this thing? What am I going to give up and what am I going to get? They're constantly trying to pursue less. Be the essentialist. I'm not going to go over all this, but like, get the book, read it. It's amazing. And lastly, read. Get on social media, follow these people, pick up a book, read essentialism, read. Be completely hungry for knowledge. Don't stop reading like the... Um, I'll make the yeah. <clears throat> Reading is to the mind of exercise is to the body. So this is from Elon Musk. So we're talking about Elon Musk. Um, you know, whenever anyone asks about Elon, how he learned how to build rockets, he said, I read books. It's true. He devoured those books. He knew everything. He's the smartest guy he's ever met. And he'd be planning to build a rocket all the way along. This is Jim Contrell on Elon Musk. This is Warren Buffett. He reads 500 pages every day. That's how knowledge works. It builds up like compound interest. All of you can do it, but I guarantee not many of you will. Read. Learn. Challenge yourself. Have an open mind. Do less. Do it better. Okay? I'm done with this. How much more time do I have? Do I have any time? No, you've got about 20 minutes. Perfect. That's what I want. Okay, so a question that I've been asked a lot, and what I've heard, a common theme in this, is... Hey, Jeremy. Hey, Dave. Hey, Paul. Like, this is great information, but I'm the only coach, and I have 25 players. What do I do? Like, you guys have completely unique situations than what we have. We have trainers. We have strength staff. We have everything going on. We have, I have all the equipment I could possibly use. So what I thought, sitting back here today, I would just take you through how I did things in the exact same situation as you guys when I was in Australia. So I was the only coach, would have 25 guys out there, and would have two and a half hours maybe for practice um, twice a week. 
And so I want to just take you guys through my thought process and how I did my practices and stuff like that. I'll draw stuff on the board. Um, can y'all see if I draw on this? Um, good? I pulled up a presentation on my Google Drive from back when I was in Australia. All right, so for me, my goal in practice was never to have anyone standing around. That was my number one goal. Because like I had them for a couple days a week, and I didn't want to waste a second. So like my preparation going into that practice was absolutely paramount. I knew I wanted to get throwing stuff done. I knew I needed to mix in some bullpens. I knew I wanted to do defensive work. I needed to figure out time to hit. I, I, there's, there's so much to do in such little time. So I always had a practice formula that I had my coaches do. And so one was a warm up. Okay? And so I actually videoed, I don't have it right here, but I, when I was in Canberra, I videoed, we made a video as a, a statewide warm up that we did. And what we did is like everything that we've talked about. We hit movement patterns, one legged deadlifts, we taught the hinge. We did all these movement pattern stuff to teach and reinforce quality movement every time they got to the field for 15 minutes on the clock. So boom, we'd start it. I knew how long it took, and we would just do different movement stuff to get warmed up, get sweating, all that kind of stuff. So we built a great warm-up. Get online, follow Cressy, research this. You can find this out online. Look it up. Make a good warm up that accomplishes a lot of things that you want to do as far as movement pattern goes. Treat this almost like a workout. Okay? Then we would split up and we would throw for 10 to 15 minutes. But we don't have just pitchers and position players. Everyone does everything, right? That's just how your situation is. So I made sure that every single player I had had a pitching type throwing program. So we were working on arm motions, arm slots. We were doing progressions and different distances. And we, were, we would do all of our throwing movements and mechanics here. We would throw med balls at the same time. I, like He knows a lot more about this than I do, 100%. But I would create throwing program here. And every time they'd come out, I was hitting almost like a pitching, little mini pitching session in my throwing program, progressing back to a longer distance. So that way, every day, every one of my players was getting attention on how to throw a baseball properly. Because I agree, we're not necessarily just pitchers, we gotta be able to throw. If we don't know how to throw, it's a problem. <clears throat> so now we're at 30 minutes. We've done movement stuff, we've thrown. Then I like to go into like a team fundamental thing. And this would be about 15 to 30 minutes depending on your time. Okay? And for me, and I'll go over different things that I did, I wanted it to be super fast paced, super energetic, and chaotic. I didn't want it to be like PFPs back to the pitcher or something boring. We had stuff going all over the field because I wanted to create chaos because every one of you, how would you describe your baseball games? Chaos. Balls going all over the place, people running all over the place, decisions having to be made left, right, like central. Like I wanted it to be quick, fast paced, so like maybe like do a two man fungo routine with pitchers popping in, different stuff like that. We would do rundown drills, we would do four corner drills. Um, maybe I didn't want to do a fundamental that day and I would just, and I had a separate coach. Maybe I would split it up and do like individual D and like hitting stuff. But this was like my skill practice time. And like you can get creative in this. And then I would always finish with live, so you understand it, we'll call it live jungle. 
I would always finish up with about 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes of live jungle work. Because what's the biggest issue that you guys have with, with baseball in Europe? How many games do you get a year? 15, 20. Anybody get over 30 games a year? A couple people in here? That's great that you can get 30 games in a year. But guess how many they're playing at that age group probably in the States right now? 75 <clears throat> plus over the course of a year. So the biggest issue that I saw with my Australians was they were just behind in decision-making skills and behind in the nuances of like the game, like the speed of the game. So we would always do something that involved like an inner squad or something along those lines here. So warm up, throwing program, some fundamental type thing or skill work type thing that was fast paced, circuits, keeping the guys engaged, no one standing around, and then like a live jungle type thing to use Dave's word. All right, so some of my favorite things that I thought did, this is my favorite drill, we'll start with a live jungle. This is called four by four, and it's a hitting drill slash everything drill. Okay, so this can get a little confusing. So there's four groups, okay? So we have Okay, we have a group of four. So this is great when you have like 16 or more players out there. Two, one group, and then you have outfield one. So outfield. Okay, so you have two groups of this. So one group of infielders, three outfielders and a catcher. That's group two. So this is group one, group two, group three, group four. Okay, so you'd have four groups, 16 people, two teams. Okay? So the rotation would be group one, hit. Group um, two, D, group four run, okay? So how we set it up is you can use a pitching machine, you can use a coach. If you're working with nine year old kids, you can do front toss. It doesn't matter. I've even done this with a T, with like young T ballers. It doesn't matter. The point is we want the ball put in play and we want the ball put in play relatively hard. So this is more of a drill for defense in like live game situations and like a little bit easier batting practice, but like not too easy. So the group one's hitting. While group two, the outfield, and the other infield group are on defense. Okay, group four, they're running. They can be at home plate. They can be at first base. They can be in whatever spot that you want. So let's say I'm throwing. Group one's hitting. The first hitter's up. They have five swings. I throw. Boom. He hits it. That runner plays it live. The defense plays it live. As soon as they get the out, they toss in the bucket. Next ball, same hitter. Boom. Second pitch. The next runner goes. Defense plays it live. And we go five pitches. On the fifth pitch, the, bait, the guy hitting runs. The whole thing's played live. So that one hitter hit and that defense got five live outs. Well, I have four hitters in each group. That's 20 live outs each group. I would get through maybe two rounds of every group in about 45 minutes. That's how many games? You just play multiple games in 45 minutes and you keep the pace. If you need to stop and go have a moment with the outfield or the defense, if you have two coaches, maybe they're throwing or feeding the machine and you're out there talking, and you're having live game conversations with these guys in practice. And there's live runners. We would also put a point system. If you go first to third, you get a point. If you go second to home as a runner, you get a point. If you throw them out, that group gets a point. And we would do different point systems to create competition within this. And we would run this almost every single day as our live jungle. And it was amazing how much better our guys got better, like guys got better in the games. 
because we played 20 outs, 40 outs, 60 outs, 80 outs, one round. A uh, friend of mine who's a junior college coach will alternate each pitch. Mm -hmm. Just do BP, just coach just throws BP, then he yells live, and it's live, and they just play situations. Yep. Run on first, one out. Runner on second, two outs. Runner on third, one out. Exactly. There's so many ways to modify a BP like this. In this, so you're doing that or even this, you're getting live defensive work, live situations, hitting, and base running. All done in 45 minutes. This is huge for, for where I was in Australia. Absolutely huge. So let's say you have 20 guys. Well, maybe you just have two third basemen and they just alternate every batter. So you can stack five guys in each group and just have them rotate out there on defense. You can get creative with this. This is called 4x4. Four four. If you need more questions, find me afterwards. But this is my bread and butter. I went to this all the time. Another thing that I would do, and I would definitely modify this for older guys, but who here has problems with guys that just don't swing? Yeah, a lot of guys in here. That's the biggest problem I ran into as hitters, is they just wouldn't swing. And they just relied. They like knew that if they just sat up there and waited long enough, they'd walk. So we created something where we would just do a normal standard scrimmage, and we called it two ball. If you didn't swing at the first pitch, you had to swing at the second pitch or you are out. And all it did was it made our guys swing. And like the biggest thing, they were just scared to swing. They didn't want to fail. So I was forcing them to give it a go. So we play two ball. For older guys, what I would do is I would take like a chair and put like a med ball or something like that. And like if you hit the med ball that's in the strike zone, they're out, maybe take a point away from the team. If they swing at a ball, like maybe put a punishment on it too, just to like reinforce the strike zone. But like still keep it like short and sweet. Still try to force the action. And it's just a standard scrimmage. But I would only do two pitches to, in order to force these guys to, to play more, to swing more. Um, so back to this. You never have an ideal situation for your pitchers at this level. Never, ever. So during this time, maybe I wanted to get bullpens in. So maybe I would do like build in 15 minutes of bullpens for a couple guys. And I would run pressured bullpens. So I'd have two bullpens going at the same time, and then we'd have a competition. Each guy's throwing 20 pitches today. I would track strikes and track sequence. I would like write out a sequence, and I would track how many strikes we threw. And it'd be a competition between those two pitchers. So I'd run pressure pins, and I'd then have my hitters stand in on that so no one was, no one was um, standing around doing nothing. They'd then stand in on the bullpens, and they would try to say yes for strikes and no for balls, before the guy, like, it got off the, the mound, so as early as possible. So you're getting bullpens in, catchers are getting work in, and your hittings are getting live swing decision reads in from live arms. It takes 15 minutes. You just got to plan this stuff out. So maybe I do that, then I would go into like a quick fundamental type thing. Oh, back here. Another one of my favorite drills for really U18 and down. Um, so there's your infield. This would be a rundown drill. Three minutes is the last one I'll do. This is a rundown drill. Eight minutes? Okay. Um, I'll, we'll cut it in half and go five. Um, I put a pitcher on the mound. So we have base runners at each one of these positions. Um, so first, second, and third, not home. And then we have an infield out here. Okay, so you put your infield out here. So you have a shortstop, second base, first base, third base, and then a catcher. Okay? Runners here, you pick. So we're working on picks. This guy then gets into a rundown. They complete the rundown. As soon as this player's tagged, this player runs home. 
As soon as he's tagged, this player runs home. So whoever has the ball here has to stop, redirect, make a throw home. Now we have a run down here. Everyone has to back up and go to the right spots. As soon as this player is tagged, this player goes. This player then throws here or there, has to make the right decision, and then that run down. It only is completed when everyone is tagged out. This is chaos. But I cannot tell you how many times this came up in the games and we, we wind up winning a one-run game or got out of a big situation because we were ready for the chaos. Not only were we ready for the chaos, we were practicing throwing off balance. We were practicing making high-pressure throws. We were practicing standard rundowns. We were practicing pickoffs. So you could do the same thing and do a pickoff here, run down here, Throw to first, run down, throw to home, run down. You can do anything you want. Heck, if you wanted to, you could do a third base move and do that whole thing. Get creative with this kind of stuff, guys. Like, create these mini games. This is high intensity, chaos, throwing on the run, making decisions type work. For the younger guys, what I would do is I would just put them at every base. Like, let's say I had eight year olds, put them at the base. And we would have a competition, and I would track this. Okay? Maybe the very first practice, our goal was 10. If you, throw it to, if you throw it long, you can throw it short. If you throw it short, you have to throw it long. And we would see how many throws we could make without pulling a guy off the back. And for an 8-year-old in Europe or Australia, that's really hard. And then maybe we would put a clock on it. Hey, we got to get 20 in the next whatever amount of time. So now there's pressure. And guys are making throws and guys get into it. I remember one time I had a little league group and they got up to like 26 or something like that. And they were so happy. They were so thrilled. They like beat their past record by like 10. But guess what? It worked because we measured it. We tracked it. And then when they beat it, they were excited and proud of themselves, and they wanted to do it again. It kept them motivated. And then when they got good at it, I then added a clock, and that made it harder again. And, like, keep all these principles that we've been talking about in mind, and, like, get smart and creative with your practice plans. A good warm-up, a good throwing program that accomplishes a lot of things. Build in a time to do bullpens, stand-ins to get your hitters more reads. Have good, fun fundamentals that keep the players engaged and always moving around. And always do some type of live BP, scrimmage, external focused, chaotic, jungle type practice to finish it off. That practice would take me less than two hours. Less than two hours. And we would run that a couple times a week. And my guys are ready to compete. So like... These are the questions that I've been hearing a lot in private conversations. I just want to take a quick minute and let you guys know what I told my coaches over in Australia and how we did that to try to accomplish those goals. So thanks for letting me ad-lib a little bit.